Tony, now that you've uh, done another workshop, you're, you're building confidence in your ability to troubleshoot, to apply engineering principles in a, in a new way, to different kinds of problems that you may have seen before. Um, we last week did uh, the grouping temperature problem, and we got through the uh, solution pretty well. We didn't quite get uh, the solution, but we're kind of zeroing in on, on the, uh, the lack of air. And the way the class did that problem is it, it kind of a nice lead into what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning. But, but just to re remind ourselves, there's a, there's a question about what is the root cause. If we're looking for the root cause in that particular problem. It was that there wasn't enough air, and that the operator hadn't increased the air while increasing the production rate. If that's sort of the sort of an immediate cause, then we have to say, well, how are we going to prevent that in the future? And then we have to look at the way the equipment is designed, and the way the operators are trained, and also the way the control system was in. So ultimately, we said. Immediately, we're going to have a solution. We're going to put more air. Well, we're going to first of all reduce the fuel, so we're going to blow the thing out. And then we're going to bring them both up together. We're going to make sure we have excess air. But then, the longer term, while we, uh, as the plant's running, we're going to have to implement a new control system. So we have to think about this longer term. How do we change everything in the company, including our design practices, standard practices for designing? So. There would be a manual on how do you design a heater, fire heater. And then that would have to be corrected to make sure that we uh, took this into consideration. We'd have to train operators on how to diagnose the problem. So there's a lot of things that go into the ultimate solution of the problem. There's the immediate solution, and then there's these longer term things. And you as an engineer are going to be responsible for all of those. So let's, uh, I'm going to just, there's a handout here, and I'm going to skip ahead. Page three. You got the handout. Page three. I'm going to scare a few things here. Okay. So this is, uh, in a sense, we stopped a little prematurely, and when we we're solving the problem, we said, "Well, there's not enough air," without trying to figure out why there isn't enough air. So let's look at this little scenario here, where there's a professor and a student. Some might say that the little one-eyed troll looks like Professor Duck. I wouldn't say that. You said he, it does look like Professor Duck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So what's the cause? So the professor says, "What's the cause?" Oh, the temperature size. No. All right. What's the cause? Oh, what's the cause? The high temperature and the cooling water flows too low. What's the cause? All right, we're getting frustrated. I mean, when does it stop? Well, we should only stop when we have the, the fundamental root cause. But this thought process that we're going through here is, is very typical, and it's not bad. It's very difficult to go from the symptoms to the exact root cause. It's almost impossible. So we're going to go through using our engineering principles. Well, if there's something wrong with the conversion, well, I think the temperature's too high. And then why is the temperature too high? Okay, there's a cause for that. But we want to get down, we don't want to stop here and get frustrated, we want to get down to the real root cause. Okay. So, why is it so difficult? Well, we have a set of symptoms, but we may have 20 or 30 possible root causes for those symptoms. So how do we get from, from the symptom to all of these root causes? We might get to one or two of them, but we want to be able to understand all of the potential root causes when we're solving this problem. And that, that's very difficult. So, and, and we're working at, remember, these root causes, one of these root causes will cause the symptom. Now, our thinking has to go backwards. And it's not a unique path. There are lots and lots of different paths there. So what, what is this troubleshooter doing? in that little scenario. Professor. Well, the person's a reaction engineer. So the engineer's using principles of reaction engineering to look back 
Now this is, I don't know what you want to call it, intermediate cause, something like that. So we're, we're, we're looking at conversion. We're saying, well, I think it's related to temperature in this particular path. Now what's causing the temperature problem? There's a heat transfer problem. So now we're applying our heat transfer. And then maybe we use our fluid mechanics. Maybe the pump head is too small to achieve the needed flow. So we're doing this. This is very natural. And it's not wrong. It's OK. It's fine as long as we have enough discipline to not stop here or here, but finally work our way all the way to the end, to where there's, there's a initiating cause. Because we just say, well, the temperature's too low. We haven't figured out what's causing that low temperature. Something physically is, is going on to, to create that low temperature. So we need to have discipline in, in, as you go through this. And, and the procedure is fine. It's very good because we're using different engineering principles in each one of those steps. So we break it into segments into smaller problems, and then we still look for causal relationships from this. Now remember, this is this is not unique. We may have several co potential causes for the low temperature. So this one is the cooling water flows too low. There may be another path going down to another root cause that maybe the cooling water temperature is, is too hot. But, so we're going to have to follow each path and at each step we use different, different principles, physical principles and understanding of equipment. So let's do, we're going to work out a little exercise here to uh, understand this. And we're going to end up developing a diagram like this with lots of branches, a cause-effect diagram. Uh, so here's a little physical example. So this is from your favorite two distillation problem. So we just looked at the top of one distillation tower. So this is a little cut off at the top of the distillation tower. The vapor comes overhead. It gets condensed, partially condensed here. Then the liquid and the vapor flow into this drum, the reflux drum. There's a vapor product that's coming off. And there's a liquid product. <coughs> the pump and goes back as reflux and out as the C3 product. So we have two products overhead and the reflux going back to the tower. Of course, down at the bottom of the tower, which isn't shown here, all the rest of the stuff goes out. So this is our, our little picture uh, of the issue here. So we have the symptom is a high level in V30. We have a high level of V30, that's our symptom. And we want to do some troubleshooting on that, on that symptom. And we're going to do that by developing a cause-effect diagram. How many root causes are there? So just mentally think about how many root causes do you think there are. Okay, let's see what we have. We're going to start with this. So, so here's the high level, that's our symptom. And we're going to have a little a branch. So what I want you to do first is to think about what are, now the, we're not going to find, try and find the root cause immediately. We're going to find these in, intermediate causes. And then ultimately, as this tree works back here, and uh, we're going to end up over here with some root causes. So these, these three lines that I've started with are not root causes, but they're causes of the symptom. So what I'd like you to do is to try and come up with three things that would cause that high level in the drum that we can then work backwards to finally ultimately find the root cause. Okay. There are three that are kind of very fundamental that are always going to occur when one of these three, I think, has to be true for this symptom to appear. So take a couple minutes and work with your friends on what, what could be these three that will then branch further. Thank you. 
So fill in one more intermediate cause, one more step towards the two causes. <coughs> used to measure the pressure or measure the level.
forced more fear to the world. Okay, yeah, so so maybe we've increased the reboiling duty. And or we increased the feed rate, whatever. But now we're getting to, we're just getting more vapors coming over. So in both of those situations, there's really if those are the true root causes, there's really not a problem. The level will just be going up. And ultimately the level controller will increase as well. So those two would be saying, if those are true, we should just wait a little bit and, and observe the level control and make sure the level control is still working, and then we'll, we'll come back to just a higher production rate out here with no other serious problems. So those are possible. And there are others. Okay, so what about too little liquid coming out of the tank? What could be causes for that? Yes, some kind of pump failure. Okay, so we could have the motor that's driving the pump fail. We could have the connection between the pump and the motor, because they're they're separate, they're separate machines, if you will, and then they're coupled through the axle, the drive, and then they're they're connected in a way so that they can break. They'll be the weakest point in the break. And they're it's very they have to be aligned very carefully, otherwise they'll wobble and damage. Okay, so we could lose electrical power, the motor could have shorted out, the coupling, the connection could have broken. There's lots of things like that that could happen. Okay, what is there another one? What about another one? Yes? It is like a block line. Okay, so a block line is always possible. Is it, with clean fluids like this, it's less possible. To, to, to get enough into the foreign material in. Now, if you're dealing with something like, like wood pulp, so Dr. Pelton likes wood pulp, and that's really messy stuff. If you look at something that's 5% wood pulp, it hardly flows at all. So, so there, it would be very easy in that kind of a plant to get, uh, to get a blockage, and that's very common, as a matter of fact. Okay, so that would be a possibility. <coughs> What else? Yes. We have an issue of one of your valves that be sticking. Okay, so so something maybe isn't being correctly manipulated in one of these valves, so it could have stuck. Could have stuck. Uh, maybe the operator inadvertently put that level controller on manual and then forgot about it. That's exactly what happened to, to, to initiate the BP Texas City. The, the operator left something on manual. It shouldn't have been on. So if this controller isn't working, then the uh, the level could maybe take not take it up to the level. Okay, good. So we see there's lots and lots of possibilities for for this. So here's what I get: connection between the sensor and the vessel is plugged. So the you're, you're measuring the pressure in the bottom and the top. By the way, your answers are fine. Right? Those are just the ones. So if one of these lines gets plugged up, now the pressure, you're not really measuring the pressure difference. The instrument doesn't know that. Right. Tower feed rate's been increased. Okay. Yeah, that would not be a problem because that's just something there'd be a transient with the level going up. And the pump motor stopped. Okay, so, and then we'd have to go back and say, why did the pump motor stop? Did the motor fail? Power, <coughs> or if it's a steam driven, do we lose steam? So, uh, what I have here is a, is, a, is a partial solution to this, and so I'm going I'm to hand this out. So I'm going to put it on the other side there. And just to look at this, now, this is a very, very simple problem. This is a problem. What's interesting is that we see there's lots of possible solutions already. Possible causes. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so this is a Thank you. 
So, uh, number one, we don't do this for every fall in industry. So there's not going to be a big book of these things. There probably should be a big book of these things. But it's worthwhile. We have to do this thinking. As we're solving the problem, we ultimately have to go through all these paths. So it's worthwhile just seeing a picture of how complex this <coughs> little problem is to really appreciate how why troubleshooting isn't obvious. We know each one of these principles because under pressure, we're going to have to develop all of these branches. Develop all these branches. Now, I think the airline industry actually has these kinds of troubleshooting uh, scenarios worked out for pilots. So if something goes wrong and they lose an engine and something else is happening, they can get some help in troubleshooting because it's kind of important up there. Right? Uh, so it's good to it's good for us to, to think through the problem completely and see, for example, too much liquid, extra condensation, cooling water temperature, the steam valve opens, that's the reboiler, increased feed rate, so So, and here's too little liquid leaving the tank, and that spreads out further. So, so as a troubleshooter, we have to use this thought process, we have to have all of these things in our head so that we can then look at the initial symptoms and then do some maybe diagnostic actions and identify which of these happens to be the true root cause. And so we appreciate how complex the, the, the thing is. And if it's critical, if it's time critical, how difficult it would be for an operator to go through this entire thought process. So you have to think, quite often engineers in their offices, in our offices, we say, oh, it would be easy to do that and solve that problem in a few minutes. We realize that it's not. So then what you want to do is you want to add additional sensors or additional information to help the person do the troubleshooting. You definitely don't want to do what they did in Three Mile Island to give them the wrong information, saying, well, when the light goes out, the valve is closed. That's really bad, but you could also give them a, a temperature at the outlet of the, the relief valve. And if that temperature stays high, that means the relief valve is leaking. And even regardless of whether the light is indicating the valve's closed or not, if that temperature stays high, we're leaking steam, and then the operator knows that it can take the appropriate action. So we have to think creatively about how we, how we provide information for the troubleshooter is normally the operator to be able to do this, and do this quickly in, in emergency situations. Okay. So let's let's look at the exercise, the solution you have there. This, so this is the cause of cause effect diagram. Some people call this a fishbone diagram, but actually in, in the fishbone diagrams have slightly different rules. These are causal relationships. In fishbone diagrams, which are used much more in management, so maybe some of you in engineering management have seen fishbone diagrams, they'll, they'll combine all of the personnel issues in one branch of the fishbone and other issues. So they're not entirely cause and effect. Here, which is, we're engineers, we like really hard facts, so we're looking for hard cause and effect relationships so we can trace these paths back. So the cause effect of the diagram of the uh, many root causes. Add at least one additional root cause to each of the major branches. So, so is this the complete solution? No. This isn't even complete. I just got tired. Okay, so so why don't you try and add another root cause oops, onto each of these branch, branches, these major branches.
Okay, here's a, here's a solution. We haven't got a lot of time because there's another topic coming. PEO is coming. Uh, so, for one answer on sensor failure, the alarm sensor it has been improperly calibrated. So where the alarm maybe should have gone off at 80%, somebody calibrated it at 60%. An alarm occurs when the actual level is not above, the, is not high. Okay. So no excursion has occurred and the solution is to recalibrate the alarm sensors. So alarm sensors, everything that can be calibrated can be miscalibrated. I was working at a plant and it kept shutting down. And every time it shut down, it cost us about a half a million dollars. It kept shutting down. I couldn't figure out why it was, it was, uh, it was, it was shutting down all the time. It ended up that an instrument tech had calibrated the shutdown system with the wrong value. So when a pressure got very low and we were in danger of sucking air into a hydrocarbon system, we had to shut down. But it was just calibrated wrong. And we did that about five times before. And every time we sent people back to check the calibration, they came back and said, yeah, we were checking like thousands of things. Yeah, they said the calibration's correct. It was only the, after the fifth time that somebody noticed, oh, well, it's not really correct. It's wrong. So, so one of the things about startup or any time you, you change an instrument or change a device, make sure the calibration's correct. And in that case, it was actually the pr process was to have one person calibrated and an independent person kind of check to make sure. And obviously, somebody wants to do it. Uh, okay, here's an additional one for too much liquid in. The cooling water flow rate increased. Oop, I think we got that. Resulted in more liquid being condensed. Okay, so, so as complex as this is, it's still not complete. So we have to be really open ourselves to lots and lots of possibilities and failures in the approach. Now, the last thing to think about, what about the designs, the reports that you handed in already? Professor Dunn is great. We should ruin his not too bad. Uh, how would you do for troubleshooting? Have you got sensors there? for the likely faults that occurred in that clip? Probably not. But that's okay, because you weren't required to. But if you had that report back, you could add, you could go through, first you look at your, the part of the process you're dealing with, you look at the common faults, and then you say, okay, how are each one of those faults going to be diagnosed? You do that during your HAZOP studies, in your plant, as you go through the entire plant, so it would not just be safety, it would be things like troubleshooting. Operability would be, in, now that you have this new view of the world, you'd include those in your HAZOP studies. And then you'd come out with an A plus instead of just an A. Okay, so that wraps up our, our troubleshooting. Uh, any questions, comments? We'll post uh, this solution. Uh, you can take a look at if you like. Now, nobody leaves the room because you have to look at the video. This is going to cost you money. Okay. When, you're, when you're performing this kind of troubleshooting, would you normally, like, once you get to the particular problem, do you do you basically do you usually check with your special check to see if it's on your You know, or as you go across, or do you want to do this at that? Yeah, it depends, it depends on the time. So, so there's a whole set of criteria for what, how you make the decisions. So you want to do things that are fast and eliminate lots of possible root causes at the same time. So if I could come over here, is there something I could check uh, here that would eliminate all of these? So if there's a duplicate sensor, I can eliminate things quickly. So I, I, I want to do things that are fast, and eliminate lots of possibilities. <coughs> if there's something time critical, let's say I, I need a sample to go to the laboratory, it's going to take four hours, I may send that right away <coughs> and then still continue on with other problem solving. Even if that's a low probability that that's really the root cause, 
I'm going to get that underway fast. So you do all those things, and then you start to go to the slower things, like bringing in uh, equipment to irradiate a distillation tower and see if the trays are really there. That's very expensive. And then finally, the shutdown. So yeah, so fast and uh, effective if you can. So you do the look at the things in the control room first before you send people out running around to the plant to look for things. And that's discussed a little bit in the chat. And also in Dr. Wood's book. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see that. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, no. That was one of those questions. All right, okay, so I'd like to say thanks to Dr. Martin for the class four classes. What's that? Oh, oh right. <laughs> get some exercise. <laughs> I'm too old, I can't get back. <laughs> so Dr. Mata was telling me that uh, he's had to out of, come out of retirement and shave every day. <laughs> I've been doing the opposite. <laughs> so thanks very much. Um, for, for the show. Thank you. I'll just sit here. <laughs>